Red Rose Radio Reception. Basics Big Blue Cassette. Listen at your own peril. How do, Joanne? Hello. Hello. It's about the driving test that I have. What happened was it was cancelled due to the weather. It was foggy at the time. And what I was... I, I went for the test. I had the lesson before. And I had to pay for the actual test. And I, I, didn't, I thought this was unfair. When you say you had to pay for the test, you presumably mean you had to pay your instructor? Yeah. Well, that's fair enough. His vehicle was out of service. But I didn't actually have the test. Though. But that's not his fault. He can't... He can't afford to lose that money simply because the weather's not right. So I can't really claim anything. I would try. I would say to him, look, I never had the test, so what the hell should I pay for Please. the... It's a bit difficult with fog, because they don't give you a decision straight away. They say, well, it might clear up later. Because, I mean, really, I was ready to take the test and... Well, yeah, we, well let, let's get out of the way first of all, Joanne. The, the driving instructor can not be blamed for the weather, neither can the test centre. Now, the test centre give you a retest as soon as possible for the same fee, do they not? not you don't have to pay them again, so we've got that out of the way. All we're talking about now is whether the instructor should have said to you, there won't be a test today, so you don't need this hour. Yeah. Now, I don't know what the true legal answer is to that. I certainly would say to your instructor, why should I pay when I didn't have the time? Or did you actually have the time as a lesson? I had the two hours before. I had already... I had you had your double lesson, yes. You had your two-hour lesson, yeah. the standard con, yes. You had that. And then you paid for the use of the vehicle on test. Yeah. That's, what, that's the bit that annoyed me. Well, you didn't use the vehicle on test, so I suggest you say to your instructor, I paid you to use the vehicle on test, but I didn't get to use it. His answer, if he's got his head screwed on, or her answer, if she's got her head screwed on, will be, but it was available for your use. Therefore, it was not available to somebody else. Therefore, I'm entitled to my fee. That is a matter for the test centre. They have their rules and regulations. That's not your instructor's fault. Right. Okay. okay. Sorry, love. Bye bye. Bye. How do you, Mick? Hello, Alan. Yes. Um, I'd like to talk about catalogue companies, please. Well, you can't because you're putting on a false voice. How do you, Charles? Hello. Yes. Uh, some words about British Telecom. In particular, the telegram service. Well, there uh, is no telegram service anymore. There is. It's telemessage, I isn't it? Well, whatever. Well, to say there is and then to start saying, well, well whatever, I, there I, isn't. It's I, called telemessage. Carry on. I rang up the other morning, early, about 8 o'clock, to send the telegram. I rang the telegram department and uh, they, first of all, asked me uh, what location. I said local. And then they asked me for when delivery. So I said, well, for today. So they said, well, I'm sorry, we don't do uh, a same-day service now, a 24-hour service now. It will be for delivery tomorrow, which rather surprised me. And then, uh, which surprised me even rather more, was the fact that I was told that if I sent a letter at that particular time, it would probably get there before the telegram, and much cheaper, of course. So I wondered, perhaps, why do we need a telegram service? The answer is we haven't got one. No, well... We haven't got one. We have a tele-message service. Ah, well, I... And it's almost always now used for greetings. Yeah, in, in point of fact, it was for a greeting that I wanted to send it. And it was... Uh, uh, my daughter, actually, had had a baby that day, and I was sending a telegram to her, and uh, they said, sorry, not until tomorrow. In that case, I stand with you and say, why do we need to send them? But the answer to the question is, it's nice to get a tele-greeting. You get a pretty card and it's it's a bit special. It's a little bit more special than a letter. And a hell of a lot sight, a lot sight dealer. Well, it's like if you send someone a glass of bitter, it doesn't cost quite as much as if you send them a bottle of 1924 Moet yeah, and Chandon. I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> So if you want to buy quality, you've got to buy quality already, you've got to pay yeah. the price, man. Well, the, fu the funny thing about it was that uh, I rang up the operator, the ordinary operator, 100 to start with, and asked for telegram service, 
and she just said yes and put me through to telegrams. Yes, but rather rather than get into a, a, a great conversation, as indeed we've just had, Charles, she just thought, well... Yeah, I silly old, silly old probably just wants tell him message. <laughs> All right, Charles. Okay, thank you. What was it anyway? Was it a boy or a proper one? It was a boy. Oh, <laughs> never mind. You can't win every time, mate. No. Okay. Bye bye. How do, Mark? Hello, Alan. Yes. I'd like to put to you an incontrovertible argument in my mind against the existence of God. Go on. <laughs> right. Uh, it seems to me that in most. I, I don't want to. I don't want to put you off your stride straight yeah. away, Mark, but you sound like you're ringing from a church. <laughs> I've got a what? You sound like you're ringing from a church. It's very accurate. Yeah, I know. It's a big hall, actually. I'm Carry sorry on. about this. Here's Carry the only place I can get a phone. Uh, it seems to me that in Christian faith, and virtually every faith known to man, past and present, there have been three main tenets or maxims. One is that God is omniscient. Uh, he knows everything. Two, uh, God's omnipotent. He's capable of doing everything. And three, that man has got free will. Now, my argument is that if... God is omniscient, he's going to know exactly what I'm going to do tomorrow. In other words, whether I'm going to have a coffee at lunchtime or not. Now, if he's omnipotent, he could come down tonight in some whatever guise he likes and tell me quite straightforwardly whether I'll have a coffee or not the next day. Now, if he says that I am going to have one because he knows that, have I then got the choice to have a coffee or not? If I have got a choice, then he didn't, and, and I choose the opposite of what he, sa he stated, then he wasn't omniscient, he didn't know the fact. If I don't have a choice, then I don't have free will. So it seems to me these three tenets of every faith I can think of are mutually incompatible. Now, my actual question, Alan, is how can it be that a religion can deny a logical argument like that? How can it be that you can actually overstep a logical argument like that? Because religion does not rely on logic. Right, yeah. Now... I can see that some arguments against God, for example, like uh, how can it be that the Mexican earthquake occurred or so on, are just uh, uh, leading arguments, they're emotional arguments, and it's easy to answer them from a religious standpoint saying, well, you have to believe in faith and so on. But if you deny uh, a strictly logical refutation uh, by means of saying believe in faith or whatever it is, how can you then support it in any human sense. How can, how can any rational human being have any faith in it? It seems to me just lose its credence completely. Credence was perhaps an unfortunate word, yeah. but I'm sure you meant credibility. credibility However, yeah. all I can say to that is that religion, when simmered down to its base constituent, mm. it is one straightforward question. Yeah. Do you accept the existence of a God? Yes or no? And there is nothing absolutely nothing that bears any logical yeah. measurement uh -huh. to help you decide. It is a straightforward, if you believe in those things, gut decision, a yeah. feeling, an aura, a sensation, right. an yeah. emotion if you like, yeah. but it's a straightforward blind faith. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can't now, if there is a God, then that is what the God mm -hmm. demands of his believers. That mm -hmm. is the degree of belief he demands, or yeah. she for that matter. It is irrational, it is unfair, but the superiors always make unfairier demands of the inferiors. Right. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It's okay. irrational, yeah. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> Cheers. Okay. Bye-bye. How do you, Neil? Hello, Alan. Yes. Uh, I was broke into a couple of months back, and I got a form, a uh, criminal injuries form, uh, I can't. I don't know. I can't understand it. I mean, for me, you have to have an O level or something to fill it in. And I was well, let me ask you a straightforward question: Were you injured? Was I injured? Yeah, I had three stitches in my nose. Well, you said you were broken into. You see, that doesn't normally entail injury, but there was well, on yeah, this occasion. Well, I, I was beaten up on the stairs, and I had three stitches in my nose, two brown fingers, a brown thumb, and cuts and bruises. Anyway, uh, I got this form, and I haven't a clue how to fill it in. Cause I'm wondering whether you can tell me what, who's best people for go to. Just go to your nearest Citizens Advice Bureau. They will help you fill it in there and then. Citizens Advice? Yes. Well, thank you, Ben. OK. Bye. Cheers. How do you, Simon? Uh, hello, Alan. Hello. Um, I'd like to... It, it seems to me that, uh, especially over the past few months, the uh, papers and the TV uh, have been all too eager to expose the... the, uh, the uh, bad side of... Um, popular music and rock music. Uh, I'd just like to... I'll give you an example. Um, while the press have been writing about the childish pranks of uh, the Beastie Boys and uh, Samantha Fox and all, and all that lot, 
they seem to be uh, ignoring all the fine things that pop music does. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of a group called uh, Temple Minds or not. Uh, yes, I suppose you have, I've yeah. heard of them, yes. Yeah. Um, well, only uh, a few weeks ago, about four weeks ago, they um, campaigned successfully and uh, forced the release of uh, a uh, prisoner of conscience, I think they call them, from a central American jail where she was being tortured and interrogated. And uh, they've almost succeeded uh, with the same type of operation in a South African jail. And uh, the only the only reason that I got to hear about this was through the fan club and through one particular musical press paper. Now, I would have thought that um, where a rock band succeeds, where a government and where p- politicians have failed, I would think that that was worthy of a bit of... Uh, of a, a space in a, 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 a newspaper. I would have thought so too. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, could you all, read about... We, yes, all but we also, we also have the problem, of course, that the newspaper's got to know about it to report it. Yes, I was wondering that myself. I was wondering if it, if it actually got to the journalists. But well, that's, they that's... seem to be so eager to write about... Well, what... they, they only write about what people want to read about, to be honest. Yes. Oh, especially on gossip pages and yeah. tabloid newspapers. But at the end of the day, if the Simple Minds publicity machinery didn't press release their actions, mm. then there's no way the journalists are going to know about it. Someone's got to tell them for them to know. Well, I think that uh, who'd rather read about something like that than what the Beastie Boys have been uh, sliming away at, you well, know? Well, it, it doesn't really matter whether people would prefer or prefer not to read about that, as yeah. opposed to the Beastie Boys sliming away, as you don't like fully put <laughs> it. But unless somebody tells the press, they don't know. People sometimes have the... the idea that the press discover things. They don't. Mm. Somebody tells them. Yeah. Usually on a thing like that, the publicity machinery of the record label or the fan club will tell the press. Yeah. Now the press will then decide yeah. either this is a publicity stunt, in which case they'll tip it in the bin, mm. or else they'll say that's a good news story. It depends on what's on the desk the day it arrives. Well, I just thought I'd uh, tell you that uh, you gave yeah, you don't seem to have an extremely popular view of, well, an extremely good view of pop music, so I just thought I'd give you a bit of information. I have a very low view of pop music, but yeah. that doesn't mean to say that I have a low view of all pop musicians. No. All right. Jeez. OK, I'll... Ta-da. Ta-da. We shall talk to Margaret soon. Whether you're considering a Citroen, Lada or Ford for E-Day on August the 1st, give the rest the big E for John Wilding. Right now, John Wilding is getting all excited by offering truly exceptional deals on all three of these makes, along with extremely low finance on selected models. You're always guaranteed John Wilding's excellent after-sales service too, and exceedingly generous part exchange allowances. So see how easy John Wilding makes buying E-Reg cars with Citroen and Lada at Banbury Garage, Westgate, Morecambe, and Ford on the A6 gas tank. It's just I feel in the heat of the night. It's just how you feel when you know it's for real. It's a cake. It's a hit. It's a coke. Coca-Cola is it. Now, Pioneer Mutual bring you the Family Protection Plus Plan. It'll help you cope if you or a member of your family are involved in an accident. The Pioneer Mutual Protection Plus Plan will help soothe the pain of injury with up to £1,200 income per month if you or your spouse are in hospital. There's also a lump sum if any member of your family is permanently injured. All for just a few pence per day. To find out more, simply call our answer phone on Preston 562200 and we'll send you a brochure. It's a breakfast show, a morning market It's a what's on diary and a blast from Bezik Here's a paper that's on your wavelength The Red Rose Advertiser And when it comes through your front door Look inside Because all that's fit to be read Is in the Red Rose Advertiser 
How do, Margaret? Hello, Alan. A while ago, Alan, you played a record. Well, I think you did. Rather, you were somebody at Sunday morning. Uh, your old, when your old wedding ring was new. Oh, I don't remember it. Hmm. Wasn't me. Jimmy Roselli it was by, I've just been told. Who? Jimmy Roselli. Have we any more uh, information, Rod? Jimmy Roselli? Excuse me a second. Our, our Rod is doing a bit of business here. A guy called Joe Longthorn. Joe? Longthorn has Longthorn. just brought an LP out called The Singer. Long time. Yeah. yeah, and it's an LP colour singer. And if you turn it over, Rod, turn it the other way around. Let me have a look. I can't read the record label. Is it Ronco? Tell me on the inter. Oh, he's coming in. Oh. He's coming. Great Britain Records. There you are. Great Britain Records. Great Britain Records, yes. Oh, Joe Long time. Okay. Right. So now, I don't know whether you'll get that, but if you have any trouble getting it, drop us a line and we'll try and oh, get all that information played, again Alan, for you. Get it played? <laughs> Sounds a bit dross to me. Ooh, it's lovely. All right, let's go. Uh, Bring it in here, Rod. This lady wants it played. Let's have a see. Hang on, he's coming in. Oh, lovely. We'll have a shifty. I hope it's not rubbish. If you've got it me playing isn't, rubbish it's really now. Nice. It's an old Who one says this program isn't organised? Well, this is a new version of it, I think. Yes, let's have a look. Yes. Rod's out of breath. I hope you've cleaned this. There's a big thumbprint on it. Have you put that on there? No, he put it on himself. Did he? Hey, we've got a Joe Longfoot. What's it called, Joe love? Longfoot. When your old Side wedding ring one. was new. Side one track. All oh, right. Well, we'll have this then up to the news. Are you ready? Oh. Here we go then. Have a cup right. of that. Thanks a lot, Alan. When your old wedding ring is new, you've got about 40 seconds just for you, love. Thank Ta you. Ta-da. Saying it was only about 40 seconds. It doesn't sound like the kind of thing that I'd write home about, but there it is, your long poem when your own wedding ring is new, just for Margaret. And I don't think we'll ever do that again. That's not that kind of programme. See you after the midnight news. The midnight news, this is Steve Allen. The ice cool raiders who conned their way into a strong room of deposit boxes in London are thought to have escaped with loot worth some £10 million. The thieves rifled 113 boxes in the vault opposite Harrods, helping themselves to cash, gold and jewellery. Ben Brown reports. When the Knightsbridge Safety Deposit Centre was opened four years ago, it was said to be one of the most secure in the world. But the raiders got into the strong room with a plan of breathtaking simplicity. They posed as wealthy businessmen, but once inside, pulled guns from their briefcases and handcuffed three security guards. Detective Inspector Dick Leach of the Flying Squad says it was brilliantly planned. They are professional men who have acted very coolly, but my men will be working here for at least another day, two days, trying to sort out what has gone. And tonight, the firm's managing director admitted he'd been totally fooled by the thieves. Ben Brown, IRN, Central London. Colonel Oliver North has been questioned about a possible British involvement in aiding the Contra rebels in Nicaragua. North is winding up his testimony to the special Iran gate hearing in Washington. From there, Andrew Manderstam. North was asked about his relationship with David Walker, the head of a British-based security firm. It was suggested that the company might have been approached to help train and give other support to the U.S.-backed rebels in Nicaragua. Colonel North responded that he would prefer to discuss any connection behind closed doors. I don't feel particularly comfortable discussing it in open session. I think there are equities that belong to other governments that are at stake here. The chairman of the Iran Gate Committee agreed. References to any British involvement are likely to be heard in secret. Andrew Manderstam, IRN, Washington. The spy book that's banned in Britain has gone on sale in America. Copies of Spycatcher by ex-MI5 agent Peter Wright are not only being marketed at US readers, but British visitors who can come home with a book the government stopped them from buying here. Jill Tardiff, manager of a top New York bookstore, says the ban means she's having no trouble emptying the shelves. We don't have to persuade people. We've gotten so many calls today because the article in the New York Times and, of course, the interest it's generated over in England. We've gotten several calls already from overseas and we're collecting orders so I don't think we're going to need too much of a persuasive stand on this book.
A grandmother known as the Torture Queen of London has escaped a prison sentence after promising a judge she'll shut down her brothel and retire to the Spanish sun. Knightsbridge Crown Court heard that 63-year-old Adelaide Serrano tied up, tortured and humiliated her customers who paid handsomely for their pleasure. Simon Israel reports. Madame Angela packed her flat with kinky equipment, including a set of stocks and a whipping stool for what she said was bottom marks for naughty boys. And during a week's surveillance, police were amazed to see 60 men stagger out of her place. The judge said that this was the end of the road for her, but she says she's never done anyone any harm. What I did was a necess necessity for people that wanted that sort of thing. But I still maintain I've never hurt anybody, never could, and never would. Mrs Serrano was given a six-month suspended prison sentence and fined a thousand pounds. She says she's packing her bags to join her husband in Spain. Independent Radio News. Well, it's all happening tonight and it's all to do with music. A moment ago we had Margaret telling us about Joe Longthorn, or at least the original version of When Your Old Wedding Ring Was New. I'm told that Joe Longthorn, the singer of that song, is the guest on Tony Talks to, 9 o'clock on Red Rose Radio on Friday evening. Last Tuesday evening there was a guest on this very programme called, yes, Maurice Jamel, and he's on the phone. Hiya, Maurice. Hi, Alan. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing very well, thank you. I believe you've got some news for me. Yeah, the reason why I'm phoning is that through that interview, I've got so many letters and so many records to send out. Uh, I calculated it's about 400 plus, and I'm afraid I'm going to run out of records. So if it's possible, you know, I would like people at the moment to stop sending money to me because I don't know if you received any letters yourself, because you said last time that if someone wanted records, they could also write to you. And I don't know if anyone wrote to you, but uh, the, the, the amount of letters which I got over at my restaurant, I'm afraid that I'm going to run out of records, and I would like to ask people to be so kind and stop sending any more letters. Are you going to get some more records pressed? I will do that, yeah. yes. And then we'll announce it again, eh? I, I, I don't want them to be disappointed that if they wouldn't receive a record immediately after they have sent the money over to me. Smashing. I, I, I promise to them that I will honour, you know, their, 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 their letters and I will send a record to them even if I would have to print some more. <laughs> okay, but well, I would like them to stop at the moment. Please. Right, well, we're going to make it a number one hit, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Maurice. Thanks a lot. Thanks for letting us know. I only got one. I don't think they trust me with their 30 bobs. <laughs> OK. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye-bye yeah, now. Bye -bye. Maurice Yamel with a very special request, and that is, don't send him any more money! Because he's run out of records for the time being. He's going to get some more press, but, of course, he's got his new one coming out fairly soon, and no doubt there will be... Public demand worldwide for that. Thank you, Maurice. Moving home will move in the right direction with Edward Jackson's, long-established estate agents and surveyors, and a member of the Pioneer Mutual Group of Companies. We'll answer all your queries like, how much can I sell my home for? How do I go about it? How much will it cost? Do I need a surveyor solicitor? Where can I buy my next home? Which is the best mortgage for me? For the answers to these and other questions, consult the professionals and move in the right direction with Edward Jackson's. For more information, call our answer phone on Preston 562200. Mr. Smith, Miss Ann Man, are you ready for the car challenge? I'm ready. And the gauntlet has been thrown. The deck is cut. The chips are down. The stage. Okay, I get the message. I'm ready. We challenge you to sell 300 cars in 150 hours. I can do it. <gasps> and for every car I sell, 20 pounds will go to the National Children's Home. The car challenge starts this way. If you've been following the great video recorder competition on The Breakfast Show, don't miss it tomorrow when I'll be setting the next question. Once you've got all ten answers, you're in with a great chance of winning a JVC video recorder worth over £350. The Paul Fairburn Breakfast Show, the radio show with its very own video. Ring him if you dare. Alan Bensick, the late night show. Welcome, finally. 
to Tuesday, seven minutes past midnight. If you wish to join us on the phone in, we're halfway through the programme. The telephone number is Preston 561000. How do, John? Hello, Barlin. Yes. Uh, I'd like to talk about Sid Fishes. He's dead, isn't he? Yeah, I was just saying that I reckon that he was uh, innocent. What of? Killing his girlfriend. Why? Well, I just think uh, all the evidence so far points into that direction. Well, who do you suggest did it? Another person or suicide? Well, no, I know somebody who was with them shopping that day. And his girlfriend was looking at the knife, the knife, and they were messing about with her all day. Like that, and I think that at night she just was messing about with her and killed herself. I thought she had multiple stab wounds. Yeah, I know. I thought it was a particularly vicious killing, be it murder, suicide, or whatever. It takes some doing to fall on a knife 11 times. Yeah, well, he's still. What does it matter? A bit crazy, you see. Well, she, crazy she may have been, but still a difficult job to fall on a knife eleven times. Yeah, you know, I think uh, they were kind of messing about. Oh, they were messing about. So then, now there are two involved. Yeah. A moment ago, she was doing it alone, but now you've realised the stupidity of that. You've reintroduced a they. Never mind. Good night. How do Irene? Good. E good morning, Mr. Bessie. Good morning. The reason. I think the reason why you are so bitter about Freemasonry is because you've been blackballed. I've no idea. I'll have a look. <laughs> Silly biddy. How do, Stuart? Hello, I'm doing very well, thank you. It's nice. Oh, good, I'm glad you are. How do, Dorothy? Hello, Alan. I've just heard Maurice Chamel on the phone to you. Aye. Apparently he's had about 400 requests In for... excess of 400 yes. requests for copies well, of I, his record. I know it's only Tuesday, but if you're still listening, I wonder if he wants a girl Friday to do his typing. <laughs> I don't know if he's going to do any typing, but if you want to drop me a line, Dorothy, I'll pass your offer on. Right. All right. Uh, okay. <laughs> she so. made him an offer and he took an offer and all night... No, no, no. How do to whoever we've got? Rod's not told me. I don't see why I should bother, really. I don't even know where he is. You gone for a walk round block? Are you uh, are you still with us, Rod? Who's on line three? Oh, I can't wait. Please listen to my ditty. It may not be very witty, nor even slightly funny, but it will help save you money. For me, from cradle to grave, I aim to shop and save. I buy out I need, for next and out indeed. There's meat and veg and cheese and picks and booze and clothes and cards and sweets and pigs and pet food and household things. So shop and save a load down Blackpool's Waterloo Road. In the market they call new and over at road the M2. Thank you. Poetry in prices. From the new market and M2 market. It's the place to come where shopping can be fun. Country music acts, have you entered the Red Rose Radio Frontierland talent competition yet? Remember, the first prize is a holiday for two in Nashville, USA, courtesy of Transamerica Holidays and National Travel World, plus a two-day recording session at Avenue Parade Recording Studios in Accrington for broadcast on My Country Choice program, and the opportunity for regular work at Frontierland, Morgan's Wild West theme park. Heats are on Sunday afternoons in August at Frontierland, and each heat winner will walk away with £50 and go through to the final. Just send the Details of your act with your name and address to me, Mike Tunstall, Red Rose Radio, P.O. Box 301, St. Paul Square in Preston. Do it now. We need your entry before the 24th of July. And you could be on your way to Nashville. Have you got a Red Rose Radio 7-Up car sticker in your car? If not, get one now as we're giving away £5 a day, Monday to Friday throughout July, August and September to owners of cars seen with one of these stickers. To get your car sticker, send a stamped addressed envelope to Red Rose Radio Promotions, P.O. Box 301 Preston. And tune into Red Rose Radio to see if your car's been spotted. This promotion is run in association with Red Rose Kitchens of Moorbrook Street, Preston. Hi there, I'm Ian Lonsdale, and this Thursday I'll be at Kaz's Bar in Darwin, so join me for an evening that's hard to forget. There'll be loads of Red Rose giveaways, great music, and for one pound you can dance right through till two in the morning. So join me this Thursday at Kaz's in Darwin for some of the best music around.
How do, Margaret? Hello. Hello. I've just been over to Morecambe for a fortnight, and I've rang you up every night and couldn't get through. I'm, I'm, I live in uh, Castleford in Yorkshire, and that's where I'm ringing from now. Uh, I was going to say, have you got the jingles like James Whale has? What jingles? He always has all sorts of jingles on these rec- this programme on a night time. Well, yes, he needs them, doesn't he? And uh, have you heard his, re- his record? He's made a record. Yes, I know. I have a copy. Oh, have you? Yes, it's sold a quarter as many as mine did. And I, uh, as I say, I've rang you up every night. And my relative that I was with, I said to her, when I go home, I'll ring you up and try and get through to him. Well, you've done very well. Have you ever tried to ring James? Yes, yes, I've spoke to James. Have you? Yes. It just shows how popular this programme is compared <laughs> to that one, doesn't it? You can't get through on this one. I'll tell you, I'll tell you you're not as uh, arrogant as what he is. No, but I'm a lot better. He's, he's, he comes out with some terrible... Yes, he does indeed. That's probably why not as many people listen to him as listen to me. Oh. One of the great things James has is the second best late night presenter in Britain. Oh. I have the misfortune of being the first best. Oh. <laughs> well, when I ring him up, I'll tell him I've been speaking to you. Uh, well, I should look forward to your comments on what he says to you, Margaret. Yeah. He'll probably deny that I exist. Because oh. <laughs> one of the one of the things is when you're on the la- on the ladder looking up, life is not easy. Uh-huh. But when you're on it looking down, life is bliss. Mm-hmm. Good night, Margaret. Good night. <laughs> Give my regards to James. I'll do, Peter. I'll do. Yeah, I'll do one. I want to talk about the HSS. Uh, I've just moved into Bolton and uh, I p- applied for the flat with the housing departments, and they told me that the DHSS won't give me a payment to furnish me flat because I'm a single man. But if I'm a woman who leaves her husband because she's been battered, then I'm allowed, she is allowed it. I just wonder what your views were on it. Well, I can understand them helping protect a woman from further assault. Yeah. But a single fella, where were you living before? In Stockport. What were you living in? I was living with my wife, but I split up with my wife and come up both. Ah, but they I said, because I'm a single man, then... Well, you're not a single man, are you? Well, all right, then I'm living in a flat as a single man. Yes. Then I'm not entitled to payments for well, that. They, they consider that a young man is well able to deal with such problems himself. Yeah, on social sleep on security the floor. money. Well, sleep on the floor. Oh, well, yeah. And what about if they have guests round? Well, don't have any round. Oh, yeah. But they're willing to pay. £45 a week for me to live in a furnished bed sit. Well, it sounds silly, I know, but for you to furnish your flat, you could furnish your flat and then get a job a fortnight later. They've spent all that money on nothing. Not Those really, are the rules. Not. There's nothing I can do about the rules. What do you want me to say? No, but... I can't get upset about some guy suffering hardship. I'm sorry. Nothing I can do about it. And nor can I get upset about it. If you can't cope, fine, you can't cope. Nothing I can do. Yeah, but the Social Security, I paid benefit. Listen, paid... listen, you're breaking my heart here. Oh I've my... got another two hours of this program. I'm going to do that with tears in my eyes. Have you got tears in your eyes? Yeah, I'm you? really upset for you, pudding. How do, Dennis? Hello. What do you want? I mean, what do you mean? I want to know what you want, that's all. I can hear two programmes here. I shut the other off. Yeah, I think it'd be best. It would be best. All right, right, all right, man. <clears throat> listen about the uh, AIDS thing. What do you reckon if all male childs are circumcised at birth will save a lot of problems? That implies that AIDS is caused by the foreskin. Yes, if there's no skin, no foreskin, now, wouldn't that be happier? I'm sorry? Wouldn't it be better if they had no foreskins, there's no problems? Well, I'm sorry, AIDS is an internal infection. The secretions from the penis are what transfer the AIDS. No, we've not meant to. Well, I'm glad you got out of it. There must have been a lot of people limping in your ward. Good night, you're a prat. How do. George. Hello. I'd like to talk about the shortage of houses. People on the waiting list. Let's talk uh, about it then, go on. Right. All these, a lot of houses are being uh, turned into insurance offices and uh, estate agents, chip shops, you name it, it, it it's there, they're, they're turned in. 
Well, there isn't a shortage of houses to buy, George. There's only yeah, a shortage no, of rented houses. There's yeah. lots of houses to buy, yeah, yeah, providing but, you've got the money to pay for them. Yeah, I understand. But I, I was on the bus the other day, and I, I counted 500 from my house into town. Chip shops, estate agents, uh, oh, uh, insurance people, you name it. Yes, well, we, uh, places that used to be homes now being used for something yes, else. Now, now uh, tell me what you've got to say about that. Well, uh, I, I say it's all wrong. They were built for a, for a family. Now, if they're built for families, does the government allow an estate agent to take over? Well, clearly the government does allow an estate agent to well, take over. Well, do you think that is fair, Alan? Fair? We're back to that strange word again. Fair is a peculiar word. Yeah. I know I'm not going to win on the argument. Well, it's, a, it's yeah. not a case of win or lose. No, it's not fair that no, well, somebody... Well, well, hang on a minute, but there's two sides to it. No, it's not fair that a person should be allowed to sell their home to someone who's not going to live in it but operate it as a business. Yeah. On the same token, it's just as unfair that a person should be forced to sell their house to anyone other than those who wish to give them the most money. Yeah, that's quite correct. Now, that's what I was getting at. So how do we do it? What do we say? We, we have to accept an unfairness. Now, one is a moral unfairness, and the other one, I believe, would be a, an, an even more yeah. unfair yeah. situation yeah. morally. If I have my house for sale, and someone comes along and says, I will give you £10,000 for it, and somebody else comes along and says, I will give you £12,000 for it, it would be an unusual an unfair government that says to me, I cannot sell to the man that's offering 12000 Yeah. And I would be a fool to sell it to the man for 10 when there's somebody else offering 12. I don't care what they're going to do with it. I don't want it anymore as I wouldn't be selling it. Yeah. But the, the, so how do you change it? Do you legislate against an individual selling his home? Well, uh, I'll let me put it this way. The people is, uh, is uh, clamouring for houses. Why don't they let, uh, let them go in these uh, high story blocks? These uh, people uh, uh, purposely built thousands of square feet of offices in towns, not the in simple town, but in every town. The simple answer is that there's no value in those offices. Often those offices you have to rent them and yeah. businesses sensibly want to buy their own property. If you buy a, a mid a mid wars, a between wars semi detached on a busy street and you're a business, then you've always got the insurance that you can sell that property yeah. later. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's hard luck on the people who's uh, living with their relations and, and they can't get nowhere in the It is audience. hard luck, but of course, <laughs> that's the real world in the purchase yeah. property market. Yeah. The answer isn't to stop people selling to whom they like, but to build more houses. That's yeah. the answer. Now it's government well, policies that affect how many houses are built. Yes, you were talking about building more houses. Now, why don't they build more houses? I don't know the, the answer to that. It, well, I do. It's to keep the property uh, booming. If I they build more good. houses... Yeah, the, it, I, I, I honestly think that the government would be happy to allow more house building if they could find a way of funding it, because it's in their interest to do so, because, of course, most big building companies are the people that do the houses, and most big building companies give money to the Conservative Party. So yeah. it would be in their interest yeah. to allow it, and yet they don't. So I don't think you're actually right on the fact that the government are doing it for some ulterior motive. You might say the ulterior motive of profit, but they haven't got the money, they claim. Yeah, they, they claim that. But they can spend, they, uh, they can spend uh, uh, £100 million on a fighter plane... Uh, well, that's an old uh, argument, isn't yeah, it? The, gov it? the government has to divide its property, its money, if you like, yeah. in the way it thinks it's been elected so to do. Now, there's no good, no good whatsoever, and this is a government argument, not necessarily well, mine. Well, I wish it at home. Well, yes, it does, but there's no point, really, in building a thousand houses and having a Russian bomb blow them all up again. Yeah. So, there was... not expecting a Russian bomb to blow them all up. We're not doing it at the moment. The government no. would argue the reason we're not doing it at the moment is we've got all these fighter planes that are going to bomb Russia if they do. Yeah. And if we get rid of them, we won't have any houses. We'll all be living in air raid shelters again. Yeah. What price yeah, a house in the Brits? The point, well, no, you took us there. I'm telling you why the government divides its money. I mean, you can look at it another way, can't you? They shut three hospitals, you can build a million houses. Great, shut three hospitals, let a few die, and that, you'll need less houses, because more will die, and you'll save all that money to build houses with anyway. So yeah. why not shut a few hospitals? Why get rid of the bombs? Just let yeah. a few die. Easy. Well, 
Well, if they're taking out, if the estate agents and uh, and other people are taking our houses from town, why don't the uh, public, uh, uh, the people on the waiting list in the uh, housing associations and rent and councils and one thing or other, say, right, you can go in the big buildings. Uh, and, uh, because they haven't got the power to say that. If an individual no, well, wants to buy a property, they've got the right to buy it. In the time, the... Uh, the government should have the power to say, well, now then... But, George, you've not addressed the question. Here is the question again. It would be wrong, would it not, for the government to say to an individual, you cannot sell your home to that person there, wouldn't it? it well, yeah... It of would. course it would. And, and who's going to compensate them for the loss? Yeah. Who's going to compensate them for the loss of profit? Yeah. Who's yeah. going to do it? Uh, I yeah. thought when I put my house on the market, I expect to sell it to the highest bidder, yeah. and I don't expect the government to stop. That's that's life, yeah. particularly if it's your home. Is it, well, I've lived in this town for I'm 71. I've lived in this town. The family just moved out, a four bedroom house. Now there's somebody moved in. There's the plumbers, uh, the people outside doing the uh, doing it. There's a, a gang of men going in there putting new doors, new windows on, and I'll bet, bet my bottom dollar is going to be an estate agent. Now, that's all wrong in my eyes. If they've got this estate agent, you say, well, I'll, I, instead of somebody buying it at, say, 25,000, oh, I'll give you 40,000. Yes, that's OK. Uh, as long as we've got that property, it's a nice position where we can do a lot of business. Now, that's all Let wrong. me tell you, if it was on the market at 25, the estate agent will have got it for 24. They're not known for spending more money, no, George. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> anyway, George, there's nothing we can do about it. The, I agree with you that it's unfair that property yeah. is being used. What normally well, would be housing stock yeah. is converting to business stock, yeah. but the individual doing the selling has got the right and ought to have the right that's to sell right, to who right. he or she likes. Yeah. All right, anyway, mate. I'm glad speaking to you. So am I. And, uh, Anyway, we can't note about it. OK, George. OK. Bye-bye now. I'll do Bridget. How you do, Alan? Hello. Uh, I'm phoning up for some advice, really. Uh, I live in an area, uh, I'll not say where, but uh, half of the properties are boarded up with the council. Um, you know, there's loads of kids running around at night and all the electrics in the house is, are, are dangerous and the kids can't go to sleep. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, can you give me any advice what to do? It's a bit open-ended to decide on what to advise you. I would suggest that you go along... What what problem do you have? What specific problem is yours? Well, it's the house itself. I mean, the house is damp, and the electrics are terrible. They're shocking. I mean, I have three children under the age of three. Right, well, I would go to a housing advisory office yeah. or a citizen's advice bureau. To be perfectly honest, I know absolutely nothing no. about housing law. No. no. So a citizen's advice bureau or... A housing advisory officer. Yeah. Okay? Okay. I wish you luck. Alan. I'll do to nobody, but we will be talking to Joe very shortly. Presenting in the worst possible taste. A present for your most loathed companion. Watch them squirm with agony and cringe with anguish. Bessick's Big Blue Cassette. Checks on postal orders for £3.99, payable to Red Rose Productions and addressed to Bessick's Big Blue Cassette, Box 301 Preston. Bezik's Big Blue Cassette, available by post at your own peril. Hello there. I'm just having my HGV driving lesson with North Manchester HGV. They do hourly lessons and intensive courses to put you on the right road. If you're an HGV or PSV novice, for just £30, you can have a full two-hour assessment, including licence and medical fee. Now, if you pass with them, they'll guarantee you a job interview. So, what are you waiting for? Ring North Manchester HGV Training Centre on Bolton 23235. That's Bolton 23235. Hello, Joe. Hello, Alan. Um, I'm calling about... Remember a couple of months ago we were talking about the Maltesers and how they were made, the chocolate? Yes. Even I was wondering if you'd have... I've been working away a lot, you see, and I haven't had a chance to wear you lately. I was wondering if you'd ever found out. Yes, we found out. The firm that makes them, which is actually Mars, wrote to us and told us. Well, could you tell us how it is, please? No. <laughs> Alan, it's please. a secret. I was sworn to secrecy. Oh, come on, Alan. It's true, I was sworn to secrecy. Well, c can I make a co complaint while I'm on and on? Well, I, go on, feel free. Well, last night on the telly, that thing about the two, the people getting the babies mixed up, why did they have to tell you the end before they showed you the beginning? 
I'm to glue what you're on about. I didn't watch the telly. Didn't you watch it? Well, it was about the two women who thought he'd had the wrong babies in the night. It was from the 1940s. Oh yes. And it started off was, saying was that. It a, was it a play? Yeah. Well, often with plays, they tell you the end before the beginning, as it were, because they want to show you what happened yeah. before they show you how it happened. Yeah, but it was a bit silly, but they told you how it ended before the, the play actually started. Well, yes, but not plays don't always happen chronologically. You get people doing what they call flashbacks and the like. Yeah. And the say, screen it was a was true wobbling. story from... It was in Australia somewhere. Well, it's happened in this country only last year. Yeah, I know, yeah, I was reading about that. All right. That, that was a shame. So okay, thanks they for do it, film. They do it that way around because they think it's a very nice artistic effect. It always yeah. gets up my nose as well. How do Paul? Hello. Hello. Hello, Alan. What do you want? I was just wondering that there's a friend of mine who, uh, when she was young, or younger than she is now, she had a child. Since then she got married. She'd been married for eight years and she's had a fallopian tubes removed and everything. So she couldn't get pregnant with her husband. They applied to have a test tube baby on the National Health Service. Now, they're not on a great deal of money because there's not a lot of work about good jobs. And... They were told it's going to, well, they couldn't do it on the National Health Service, but they could have one if they pay £1,400. Um, how come the people that, that can't get work or they get the, the lowest paid jobs because of the situation the country's in have to pay that sort of money? Well, the, ans the answer is that there's only so much money allocated by the Health Service for such medical solutions, if you well, like. She was told that if she'd had an abortion rather than give birth to the child that she had when she was younger, before she got married, she would have more chance of uh, a test tube baby on the National Health Service. Well, that really doesn't matter at this stage. You're asking me why she can't do it on the National Health Service. The answer is there's not enough money. If you're asking me why she can do it if she pays the money, it's because then there'll be more money. It's the old story. You can't have what you can't afford. There'll be more, more money. Well, if she stumps up 1,500 quid, yeah. finding the money for it isn't a problem. She's found it. The National Health Service hasn't got the money. So yeah, what they so have to do is well, prioritise. No, I, I, I don't agree with that, Alan, because she's been told... What do you mean you don't agree with well, it? Well, what I, mean, what I mean is, she's not been told if she stumps... Well, yes, she's been told if she stumps up the money she can have the baby, but she, she's also been told that if she's had an abortion, rather than have the child then she could have it on the National Health Service. That's right. right, because she would then be in a different priority grade. They have to prioritise people's needs. So... If somebody came to you and they just chopped their arm off in a machine, and somebody else came with an headache...